The weather isn't something that any of us can control. It doesn't matter whether it's sunny, windy, rainy or snowing. What will be, will be. But we can measure it. And sometimes that can give us an insight into what's going to happen in the future. And you don't need a lot of expensive kit to do that. With just a Raspberry Pi and an extra little piece of kit, you can build your own weather station. Let me show you how. Hello once again, Pi Geeks and Techno Nerds all around the world. My name is Jeff and I'm an IT professional who's been in the industry for over 30 years. In my spare time, I like nothing more than playing around with Raspberry Pis. I'm sure you do too. If you like what you see here, please hit that like button, subscribe to see more, and also hit that notification bell so you can be told when I put new videos out. Also, let me know your favourite Pi projects in the comments section below. And if you've got any ideas for projects that you'd like to see me do in the future, put those in there as well. Now I'm quite sure, like me, you've probably seen the weather forecast on the TV and thought to yourself, this is a regional forecast, but it doesn't really seem to be accurate. It feels hotter where I am, or it feels colder. Or maybe they're saying it's going to be absolutely dry when it's raining hard outside. They never seem to get it right. Wouldn't it be great if you could have your own weather station set up so you could get a really accurate picture of what the weather's like right at your place? You can do this with a Raspberry Pi. All you have to do is connect a little board called a BME 280. Now this little board has sensors on it to measure the air temperature, humidity and pressure. So you can use this to make your own thermometer, barometer and hygrometer. Now if you see the air pressure rise, chances are the weather is going to be quite settled and quite pleasant. If you see it drop, the chances that it's going to rain are probably going to increase. And if you see the humidity rise along with that, it's almost a guarantee you'll see some of the wet stuff. And of course, the temperature is always a nice thing to be able to read. So what is a BME 280? Let's go and take a look. What you can see here is an example of a BME 280 board. They come in many different shapes and sizes and also have different pinouts. If I just search for BME 280 in Amazon, there are a whole bunch of different options with different pinouts, different sizes, shapes, and different ways that they connect to a Raspberry Pi. As you can see here, there are versions where you have to solder pins onto the board in order to provide the connectivity. Or there are ones like this on Pi Moroni where the pins are already pre-soldered, so it's just ready to go. Although, as you can see, these are a little bit more expensive. Now, all of these connect to the Raspberry Pi using a serial interface called I2C. All Raspberry Pi models support this, even the Pico. But for the purpose of this project today, I'll be using a Raspberry Pi 0W. If you look at the pinouts for a Raspberry Pi, on the left hand side here, you can see it starts with a 3 volt power supply. And then there are these two pins that are marked SDA I2C and SCL I2C. And these are the two lines that I squared C requires in order to work. There's also a handy ground pin here that we can use to provide ground to the BME 280. Now these four pins are all you need in order to get this working. Some models of BME 280 only provide these four pins. Others provide some extras, but these are the only ones that we need to worry about. Now, for everything that we're going to use today for this project, I've put links in the description below to help you find everything that you need. However, do shop around. There's a lot of variety here, and a lot of it also depends on how comfortable you are with doing things like soldering. If you have no experience with that, it's absolutely no problem. As I mentioned with the BME 280, you can get a version of that that's already got the pins pre-soldered to it. And you can do exactly the same with the Raspberry Pi Zero. There's a model called the Pi Zero WH, and this also has the pins pre-soldered onto the board, so you don't have to do it. Now, as with the BME 280, you have to pay a little more for this, but it's really very little. So now let's go and review the kit list that you'll need for this project. So the first thing you'll need, obviously, is a Raspberry Pi. You can use any model at all for this. 
However, the Pico does require a slightly different way to get it to talk to the BME 280. I'll actually cover that in a different video in the future. This video will be focused on the main Raspberry Pi models, but you can use anything from a Zero all the way up to a Pi 5. As mentioned before, I'll be using a classic Pi Zero W. And for this one, I've soldered the pins on myself. Now, if you do choose to solder the pins on yourself, you can buy packs of header pins like what you see here. These ones come in strips of 40. And the really great thing is, when you get one of these strips, you can just snap it to provide just the number of pins that you require. So with a strip of 40 like this, you can cover all of the pins that are on a Raspberry Pi. You could also then use a few pins from a second strip in order to provide the pins for the BME 280. The next thing you'll need is an SD card on which you can install the Raspberry Pi OS operating system. Any SD card with a capacity of over four gigabytes should be fine for this. The version I'm using is a 32 gigabyte SanDisk. Then you need the BME 280 itself. The version I'm using here came from Adafruit. And again, I soldered the pins on myself. The next thing you'll need is a set of four jumper wires that you can use to connect the Raspberry Pi to the BME 280. Now I'm keeping this super simple here, so I'm just connecting the wires directly to the pins on each device. As such, I'm using female to female jumper wires. You could also put this together on breadboard, in which case you'd want male to male jumper wires. Or you could go really fancy and use something like this, which is PCB board. Now here, you'd need to solder the Raspberry Pi and the BME 280 to the board and then solder in your own wire connections on the bottom. But you would end up with a really cool little circuit at the end of it. And it'd be much easier to mount this wherever you need it without a lot of trailing wires everywhere. But this is very much an optional extra. Do not feel you need to do that. What I'll be demonstrating here is literally just connecting the two together with a couple of jumper wires and it'll be fine. Now, the very first thing you'll need to do here is install Raspberry Pi OS. I'll be using Raspberry Pi Imager for this, and you can see I've already selected that I'm running on a Pi Zero and I need the 32-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS. So now all I need to do is click Next and start the process. Now, I've actually covered the process of installing Raspberry Pi OS onto an SD card many times before, but you can see my video here on the subject if you need more detail. Now, before I boot up the Pi Zero, there's a little issue that I want to tell you about. My Pi is brand new, but I've had this little problem that after I install the operating system and I boot it up, it'll run fine for a couple of minutes and then just hang and it throws a kernel panic. I found there is a little fix for this, so I want to show you that right now. I've taken the SD card and I've plugged it back into my computer. And here I've gone to the bootfs partition and then I've opened up the file config.txt that sits within it. Now, if you scroll right to the bottom of this file and you just add the text over voltage equals six and then save the file, this will fix that issue. And ever since I did this, I've never had the Pi crash again. Once that's done, just safely remove the SD card from your computer, insert it into the Pi and boot it up. Now the Pi is booted, there's one other change that I want to make before we move any further. I want to increase the amount of swap space that's available on the Raspberry Pi. By default, it only provides 100 megs of swap space. This isn't very much for a Raspberry Pi that only has 512 megabytes of total RAM. The procedure for increasing this is really quite straightforward. But first of all, let me zoom up the text a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. The first thing you want to do is turn off the swap file. And you do that with this command here. Now that's done, you can edit the configuration file that defines how much swap space is available. You do that with this command. Now I'm using Vi here as my editor. If you're comfortable using another editor, be my guest. Just come down to this line that says conf underscore swap size and change the value that it shows here. I'm going to increase this to 1024 so that we get a gigabyte of swap space available. 
then just save that out. Once that's done, then you need to run this command here to actually configure the new swap file. And once that's done, you can then switch that on with this command here. Now the swap space has been increased and we can see that if we run the htop command. And there you can see that the swap space is now 1024 megabytes or one gigabyte in size. Now our Pi Zero is all set to go and we can now go ahead and attach the BME280 to it. Connecting the BME280 to the Raspberry Pi is really simple. Just take a look at this picture here. You can see that on my BME280, I've got pins that are labeled VIN, 3VO, GND, SCK, SD0, SD1, and CS. Now for this particular BME280, all I care about are the VIN, the ground, SCK, and SD1 pins. And these map onto the Raspberry Pi 3 volt ground, SCL, and SDA pins. So I've connected them, as you can see in this picture. Now that it's all set up, we can actually check the connectivity between the two boards. In order to try this out, I'm just going to connect using SSH to the Raspberry Pi, as it's easier to capture. Now, before we can do anything with the Raspberry Pi and I2C, you actually need to enable it. Now you can do that with Raspberry Config. If you come down to Interface Options, then I2C, and you can say that you want to enable it. And now that's enabled. Now we have that. I can run this command here to try to detect what I2C devices I have available. In this last line, you can see it's come up with, with 77. This represents the address of the BME280. This is great. Now we can actually create some code to interact with it. Now I already have some Python code available to do this. It's on my GitHub. And again, there'll be a link to this in the description. All we care about here is what's in this zero directory. We've got a number of scripts in here. So what we need to do is pull those onto the Raspberry Pi. Now, in order to store the source code, I'm just going to make a directory to hold it. Move into that. And I'm going to pull all of those scripts by using this command here. That pulls all of those scripts into this weather station directory. If we move into that and take a look, we can just move into the zero directory and then find our scripts. The first script of interest is this weatherstation.py. Now, what you can see at the top of this script is that we set a variable called address to that value of 77. I then set up the I2C bus. I then load all of that into the BME280 and store the result in this variable called calibration params. Once I have that, I can then make calls into the BME280 to return me data. This will return a data structure that contains the temperature, pressure, and humidity data that I can then print out. Now, before we can run this script, we actually need to get some dependencies. And this includes that BME280 library. I've provided the definition of all of these as requirements.txt. And all of these can be easily installed with one command. Now all the requirements are installed, we can go ahead and run our weather station app. And yes, here you can see it's grabbing the temperature quite nicely, along with the pressure and the humidity figures. I can just terminate that with Control C. The next thing I've done is I've taken that basic BME280 code, and I've wrapped it up as a class that I can then use in multiple applications. Now, this is super simple. It's very similar to the code that we looked at just now. The class gets instantiated by defining the address of the device and the bus number and loading up those calibration params. I've then got a method called get underscore values within the class, and I've used that to grab the temperature, pressure and humidity figures from the BME280. I then return those as a tuple. I've got some test code here that should give us a very similar output to the last test script. So let's just give that a quick go. And 
And yes, that seems to be working great as well. Now for this project, what I want to do is present a web page that can show us the temperature, pressure and humidity figures in a really nicely presented way. So let's go and take a look at how I've done that. I've developed this application script, which is run as a Flask application. When you call this with its default root, it will just render an HTML file. And this is really, really simple. It just pulls in some resources and then displays a set of div tags that construct the resultant interface. So I've got a date container that will show you the date and time of day. And then I've got a weather container that will then display the temperature, pressure and humidity. Ultimately, I will be including wind speed in this as well. However, I'll have to cover that in a future video because otherwise it would make this video really, really long. Now, this HTML file references some other resources. So there's a CSS file to provide all of the formatting information. And there's a JavaScript file that actually does all of the data retrieval. Now, all this does is really set up this function called get data. And all this does is set up an Ajax query that calls the slash data root of my Flask application. And it gets back a JSON data structure. And that JSON data structure contains all of the information that I need, like the date, the temperature, the pressure and the humidity. For the wind value right now, because I've not implemented this yet, I just use static text of other and you'll see what that looks like on the UI shortly. But this function then just updates the contents of the various divs on the page to show all of the values. Once that's done, it just schedules itself to run again in five seconds time. So the UI will just update every five seconds. If we look back at the data route, here you can see initially I get all of the time information from the local time method within the time library. I then do some formatting of that so it will display nicely. I then call into my BME280 class to get the current values for the temperature, pressure and humidity. I then thought that it would be nice to have a different color for the UI depending on what the temperature is. So I also created this class here. It's really simple. You just pass it a given temperature and then it will just define a color to represent that temperature, given where that temperature sits within a range. I've provided some test code so you can see what it looks like. If we run that color calc Python script, you can see it outputs this HTML. Let me output that to a file. And then I'll copy that back to my computer. Here you can see the output. It's not terribly clear with the black on blue here, but you can see the colors and how they progress as the numbers change. Now here in the UK, the temperature doesn't typically drop below minus 10 or get above 30. So I've limited the ranges there, but I could have extended them out if I wanted to. Back to the application. And once I've calculated the color that I want to output, I then construct a JSON data structure here that formats all of this data together. I then just return that as a response. So let's run this up and see how it behaves. If I flip back to my browser, I should now be able to see the output of this. And yes, everything seems to be running really, really nicely there. And you can see everything is being displayed really well. I can prove the actual data structure is constructed well, not only by the fact that we see the end result, but I can call the data route directly. And you can see that this just gives me back the data. Now everything's running really nicely. The last thing I want to set up here is actually to get the web browser running on the Raspberry Pi itself, so that then I could run this as an embedded device somewhere. So let's go and get those last bits and pieces done. Now, the first thing I want to do is create a script that will run up the application and will then start the Firefox web browser to display the UI. Now, before we can actually use Firefox, we need to install it. And you can do that with this command here. Now, unfortunately, we can't use Chromium for this. Chromium's not available for 32-bit operating systems anymore. And the original Raspberry Pi Zero can only run a 32-bit version of the Raspberry Pi OS. 
As such, we're limited to using Firefox for this. If you're using any other model of Raspberry Pi that can run the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS, you could do this in Chromium instead. Now we've got Firefox installed, we can create our script. The minus kiosk option for Firefox makes it open up full screen with no menu bar or address bar shown. Private window makes it behave like an incognito window in Chrome, so you don't get any pre-existing cookies or sessions preserved within it. Now we just need to save out the file. We need to change the permissions so that it's executable. And then, in order to make this automatically run, I have to make a few changes in the Pi user's home directory. I need to move into the .config directory and now create a pair of directories underneath it. Now I have those created, I can create a file called autostart within there. I'll make all of this available in my GitHub as well. The first two lines of this file are always required. The next few lines just stop the screen from blanking at all. And the sixth line here just stops the mouse pointer from appearing. I then configure it to run my script that I created just now. Before we can use it, that's another file that I've got to mark as being executable. Now we've done that, I can just reboot and we can see what happens when the Raspberry Pi comes back up again. And here you can see everything is now running really nicely. It did take a very long time to start up. And what I found is when the Pi Zero boots, there's a lot of stuff that it starts up in the background and it takes a long time to get through it. After about half an hour, everything calms down and you can see the load on the box reduce and everything runs normally again. If I go back to a terminal session, I can show you what I mean. Now here, I'll run up the HTOP application. And you can see the box is running really, really hot. The load average is right up above five. Now this means that it's got about five times as much work queued up as it's got processing power to execute. So right now it's really struggling. But let's just leave that be and then we'll come back to it and you'll see how it calms down. So now you can see that the Pi has been running for about half an hour and that load average has dropped down quite a lot. It's going to carry on dropping down over time and will eventually calm down. But as you can see from this, the actual weather application is still running perfectly. Now, the nice thing about having the Pi actually output the web page like this is that you could do something like this, where you could connect the Pi to a small screen and then just have that somewhere in the house or maybe several of them, just to show you what the temperature is in different parts. But there are other use cases for this as well. You could mount one in a project box outside somewhere and measure the temperature, pressure and humidity outside. Just make sure that you use a weatherproof box for it. Also, you could put one inside your PC case so you can monitor the ambient temperature of your PC and maybe even set up some kind of alarming system so you can be told if your PC gets too hot. There are more uses for this kind of thing than you might think. It's really very useful functionality. So there you go, your very own weather station. Now, as I mentioned before, I will be doing some more videos on this topic. 
showing you how you can set it up with the Raspberry Pi Pico and also extend it to include some wind speed measuring as well. But if you like what you see here, once again, please click that like button, subscribe if you want to see more, and hit that notification bell so you can be notified when I do put out those new videos. And again, let me know in the comments about your favourite Raspberry Pi projects and also any ideas that you've got for me for projects to do in the future. But that's all for now. Thanks so much for watching till the end. And until next time, bye for now.